Hello and welcome to Dialogue. As the Russia-Ukraine conflict nears two years anniversary, there's more and more talk of a possible peace deal following the failure of a counter-offensive operation by the Ukraine in the summer. Meanwhile, Western support for Kyiv seems less solid than before, and the war fatigue becomes more visible. So what is the latest situation on the ground? Could a peace deal be close at hand? And after 21 months of fighting, what is the most likely outcome of the conflict? To take a closer look, I'm joined by Anton Fadiashin, Associate Professor in the History Department of American University, Mark Sloboda, Moscow-based International Affairs and uh, Security Analyst, and Peter Zamaev, Director of the Eurasia P uh, Democracy in Initiative. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue. Uh, Anton, I will start with you. So as we said, you know, we are not seeing really big changes on the backfield, but we do see changes or murmuring of uh, the emergence of uh, you know, calls for a peace deal or for negotiation between the two sides. How do you characterize the current situation uh, in terms of the Ukraine war? The Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive has unfortunately for Kiev uh, failed. Um, not only has it failed, but the Ukrainians um, have lost uh, territory uh, along the northern part of the front lines, and plus they've lost an enormous amount of men and material. Uh, we know that um, not from uh, figures, but from the fact that uh, there's serious talk in uh, uh, Kiev about um, launching a uh, massive total mobilization this week, and we'll see if this uh, if actually uh, happens. Um, Territorially, not much has uh, changed, but this is, continues to be a war of attrition. And Russia, with its strategic depth and, and its much bigger army and its much bigger economy, is poised to come out of um, this war of attrition um, the victor. Now, how that is going to happen is uh, unclear. Um, and now that we see that the West is beginning to put pressure on the Ukrainian side to come to some kind of agreement, um, I think that the biggest news in this war will now start shifting towards the geopolitical aspect, the diplomatic aspect of this, and what form the um, negotiations will take once they start. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Peter, I wonder if you agree with Anton. So we are seeing a shift, like a most, uh, mostly political shift, a diplomatic shift, rather than the change on the battlefield. Uh, that is probably there is an emergency of uh, emergence of calls for peaceful negotiation since there is a stalemate. Uh, is that what you sensed or what you get in Kyiv? Well, obviously, it's been now acknowledged by both the political and uh, not, not so much even political, but the military leadership of Ukraine that the war has sort of reached a, a stalemate and in the absence of a breakthrough in uh, weaponry and the kinds of weapons that Ukraine uh, is getting from its Western allies, it, it will be very naive to expect a significant breakthrough uh, on the part of Ukrainians, sort of what we saw in Kherson and Kharkiv uh, almost exactly a year ago. Having said that, uh, what the previous speaker said about uh, Ukraine being, uh, you know, encouraged, uh, if not forced, uh, to think about you know, sitting down at the negotiating table with uh, the Russians. So far, it's been from hearsay. And yes, um, you know, if we're talking about that uh, article in Bild, the German newspaper, uh, once again, uh, you know, the, all the sources we have for that sort of. Uh, um, idea uh, anonymous they're anonymous sources uh, so far officially we have not heard from any western leader that you know the two sides need to start negotiating uh as soon as possible once again having said that there is fatigue yes there's fatigue with the war uh on both sides on the russian side on the ukrainian side and on the side of ukrainian Western uh, allies. Uh, you know, we are not there yet because I think there's a lot of suspicion, both on the part of Ukrainians and Western countries, uh, that Vladimir Putin wants to negotiate an end uh, to this war. It seems that Vladimir Putin is ratcheting up the military effort and uh, maybe, you know, uh, come March and his, you know, election, 
where he's obviously a shoe in and we can expect him to be reelected with at least 80 percent of support, he may call another huge wave of mobilization. So we're just simply not there yet, no matter what the Ukrainians are, are, are wishing for or the Western uh, countries are wishing for. Vladimir Putin is showing no genuine si signs that he's willing to sit down and negotiate with the Ukrainian government, which he doesn't even recognize as legitimate, and neither does he recognize Ukraine's right to exist as a sovereign state as a legitimate right. Uh, but let me first have uh, Mark. Uh, uh, Mark, you know, in terms of this, uh, uh, you know, development or, you know, where we are going here on the Ukraine crisis, uh, uh, President Putin said recently, you know, uh, it is necessary to think about how to stop the tragedy of the conflict in Ukraine and uh, Russia has never refused to participate in peace talks with Ukraine. He used the word never. Uh, so it, it sounds like this is the consistent policy of Russia to uh, solve this problem uh, through negotiation, through peaceful manner. Is that the case? Well, I mean, it is true that Russia has always maintain the possibility of negotiations to settle this conflict. But it must be said that that is on Russia's terms, right? Russia is not interested in any terms but its own, which were those it clearly set out at the beginning of the intervention in the Ukrainian civil conflict in 2022. And since then, because of the escalation by NATO, through their proxy putsch regime in Kiev, that has only strengthened to include the oblasts of Kherson and Zaporozhye as well, now that they have also conducted referendums and chosen to get out of dodge of the mad regime in Kiev uh, and join the Russian Federation. However, it is the Kiev regime that has uh, passed diktats that forbid its own officials from even negotiating with the Russian government. Uh, so I uh, have to agree uh, with Peter. I don't believe that there is any serious push by Western governments uh, to force their proxy regime in Kiev to the negotiating table, uh, and certainly uh, not on any terms that Russia would accept. Uh, I expect this conflict uh, will continue for years in the future into uh, its uh, inevitable, if costly, conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Anton, uh, you know, back to this, uh, let's say, the negotiation uh, as a solution uh, to solve the problem. Uh, you know, there's a confirmation from a heavy weight, um, let's say, the Ukraine official uh, who is close to President Zelensky, uh, in the interview, he admitted, you know, there's, um, there's, you know, a point very close to a deal between Moscow and Kyiv uh, at the early stage of the conflict, uh, but uh, finally they didn't do that. Uh, so that is, you know, what do you make of that confirmation? You know, why he was talking about that now? Well, because that was, uh, this was uh, David Rahani you're talking about. He gave an interview, a TV interview to the uh, One Plus One uh, channel in Ukraine. Um, and yes, uh, he admitted what uh, those of us who have been following this conflict knew for a while now, because it was admitted by Turkish officials, Naftali Bennett, who was the prime minister of uh, Israel, who was involved in mediating the March 2022 talks, which is that there was a peace deal um, that had been drafted, initialed, by uh, both sides and the Ukrainians walked away uh, from it under uh, pressure um, from the United States and from Great Britain. Boris Johnson flew into Kiev and essentially uh, told the Ukrainians, and again, this is what Arachamia uh, um, uh, confirmed in his interview, that the West will not provide Ukraine with any security guarantees if Ukraine follows the diplomatic path out of the uh, uh, the conflict that the West expects it to fight and that it will provide it with everything that um, it needs. So um, that's a story that uh, everyone sort of knows already who's been following the comments of Western politicians uh, around what was going on in uh, uh, Belarus and in the negotiations in Minsk um, less than a year ago. The question is, why is all of this coming out now? And I think that this is uh, one of those puzzle pieces that come together to form a picture 
where Ukrainian politicians are encouraged to make statements um, that put pressure on Zelensky's government and on President Zelensky himself uh, to start coming to the negotiating uh, table. Um, whether the Ukrainians trust the Russians or not, I think is moot because the, tr the Russians don't trust the Ukrainians uh, or their Western backers for that matter. And they point to the Minsk agreement, which was actually international law because it was unanimously voted on by the UN Security Council and that Ukraine failed to uh, implement and it could have avoided uh, this catastrophe uh, that's been unfolding over the past several months. So neither side trusts each other. And that's exactly why diplomacy needs to start happening, because the alternative to any form of talks, no matter how unpleasant they will be for both sides, especially for the Ukrainian side, and I understand the difficulty in which uh, President Zelensky finds himself, the alternative to this is the continuation of this war. And if Mark is right that this will continue for many months, then Ukraine is going to be on the losing side for several reasons. First of all, it doesn't have the strategic depth. Second of all, I think your viewers absolutely need to understand that what Ukraine receives from the West is not just military support. The entire Ukrainian budget from month to month is paid for by Western uh, taxpayers. And this is not going to last for months and months and years. And we're already seeing how things are changing in uh, Washington, D.C., here where I am. Uh, the U.S. Congress has decided to take a month off before even beginning to decide on future support for Ukraine. And this cannot be good news for Kiev. And I doubt that it will be uh, better. I, I think the Congress will approve funds for Ukraine, although it will be much smaller than they were before. And the trajectory so far is for shrinking support, not increasing support. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Peter, I think Anton has pointed out a fact that is, you know, of course, you talked about the uh, I mean, uh, fatigue and uh, I mean, the gloom, uh, gloomy mood. That's understandable. I mean, after all, it's almost two years, as we said. Um, but then, you know, the key player is the Western. I mean, key point is key factor, the support from the Western uh, world, you know, both financially and militarily. Militarily, I think the Ukrainian side is demanding more uh, advanced weapons, but it's not there yet. And then, you know, financially, even uh, we are seeing uncertainty, let's say, you know, uh, from U.S. side uh, and also from European Union. You know, people are not sure like, whether they are going to have this uh, 50 billion euro uh, on the next summit in next month. So do you think that's also something in the mind of the Ukrainian leadership in terms of you know, how to solve this conflict? Well of course, it is in the mind of the Ukrainian leadership. Let me just very quick uh, two points uh, by way of correction of what the, uh, you know, the characterization of the, the previous two speakers. Very quickly, Anton, uh, the professor said that the Minsk agreement was not implemented by Ukraine. That's a perversion of history. Uh, I think the main point there was for uh, the, the Russians to withdraw uh, to the you know, uh, constitutional borders, uh, the sovereign <laughs> borders of Ukraine. They never did that. So it's an open question who really violated the Minsk agreement. And um, uh, Mark Sleboda said, that you know uh, mentioned the invasion of Kherson and Zaporizhia as if that's uh, uh, you know part of uh, Putin's original plan. Don't uh, forget that Putin claimed that he was uh, his uh, goal was to liberate the Russian speakers of the Donbass of the eastern uh, part of Ukraine. So what uh, in the world uh, are the Russians doing in Kherson? and Zaporizhia in the south of Ukraine. And they've already annexed those parts and uh, uh, changed the constitution to reflect their sovereignty over these territories. This just shows you that this is an imperial, uh, you know, a war of grabbing another country's uh, territory style on the 17th century conquests in Europe. Uh, as to your question regarding the Western uh, support, uh, and we mentioned Congress, this is where obviously the part and parcel of the support resides. Uh, the military assistance, the bulk of it uh, um, comes from the U.S. And what I've heard from Mike Johnson, the new uh, speaker of Congress, is actually very encouraging. He himself has said, I'm quoting, he's confident and optimistic that Congress will be uh, able to pass additional funds because they're tied as part of a package, including uh, Israel and Ukraine and the border with Mexico and even uh, in other uh, areas. Uh, he says there's a sense of urgency uh, in getting aid to both Israel and Ukraine. And finally, and very crucial, we can't allow Russian President Vladimir Putin to march through Europe. And we understand the necessity of helping Ukraine. Yes, there is. I don't see that support will increase necessarily, but I don't see that uh, in the near future, at least, 
the drop off will be drastic. Uh, Western countries understand that uh, they will be shooting themselves in the foot by allowing Putin to walk over Ukraine. Uh, this will create a dangerous precedent uh, for uh, the security of the rest of Europe. And where I'm talking about the Baltic states, I'm talking about Moldova. It's a whole domino effect. Do European uh, uh, leaders, do Western leaders have a, a, an answer uh, to, this, uh, to this war? They don't. But at the same time, I do not see a, a resolve on their part to just drop Ukraine, to force it uh, to come to the negotiating table before it is time to do so. Uh, it's a very complicated question. Uh, there's no black or white uh, scenarios here, but also to say that they will just uh, let and leave Ukraine hanging in the wind. I think that's also very premature. Very premature, I mean, to leave Ukraine alone. Uh, so, Mark, of course, just like the U.S., uh, I think the defense secretary said that, you know, uh, we have to, um, you know, uh, basically support Ukraine. I mean, if uh, Putin... Uh, wins this war and that somehow Russia will move beyond Ukraine to European uh, territory. Okay, you earlier mentioned about if there's a peace deal, you know, it must be on conditions of uh, Moscow. So what are the conditions? What is exactly the goal of Moscow? Yeah, um, uh, despite uh, the narrative spun by Peter Zalmayev echoing the West Bank Kiev Putsch regime, um, Russia has been quite clear from the beginning about their goals. Yes, it was to fully liberate the people of Donbass, to stop the Kiev regime's 10-year bloody war uh, on that part of the country for refusing to accept the overthrow of the government, the last legitimate democratically elected government that they had elected uh, in Kiev. Um, uh, as well as that, um, the, the Ukrainian constitution should be returned to what it was before the overthrow in the government in 2014, which was a guarantee of uh, Ukraine's neutrality, uh, that it should not join NATO or the Russian-backed Collective Security Treaty Organization or any other military alliance, uh, but also the demilitarization of Ukraine, the denazification, perhaps much better termed as the debanderization uh, of Ukraine. Um, and uh, since the, the conflict uh, has uh, uh, commenced, um, the uh, Kherson and Zaporozhye, uh, which fell into Russia's hands very early into the conflict with almost no fighting, uh, because uh, you know the, the people there largely didn't want to fight for the regime in Kiev. Uh, and in fact, the Kiev regime has launched an investigation conducted by the Ukrainian intelligence agency as to exactly what happened there with the ultimate political goal probably of pointing the figure at, at Zeluzhny for, for a, either treason or incompetence. Um, so, uh, you know, those are the specific goals. But it must be said, as NATO has escalated further in this conflict, I think that uh, the minds in the Kremlin have hardened. I think that they see that there is no possibility of a diplomatic uh, negotiated solution either with the proxy regime in Kiev or more importantly with the United States um, that can be trusted. Uh, because of the failures of, well, the February 21st agreement, the Minsk Accords, you know, and, and every other agreement that, you know, that the U.S. has, has pulled out of in, in the last couple of, of decades. Uh, therefore, uh, I, we have heard repeatedly from uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the former president and prime minister and still uh, deputy chair of the Security Council. We have heard from Lavrov. We have heard from numerous Russian officials that this ends in regime change. And that is a long, bloody, costly war of attrition road. But I do not see any other way that Russia's goals for this intervention in the Ukrainian civil conflict can succeed. Oh, well, um, I mean, if that's the goal, as Anton, if that is the goal, I mean, that's a, that's a still a bit long way off. And but, um, you know, the foreign minister of, um, of Russia, uh, Mr. Lavrov, you know, in response to the U.S. Defense Secretary, uh, what they said, you know, he pointed out Moscow does not have plans to expand its territory any further in Europe. 
uh, do you believe that's the case? Because there's a talk of like, oh, Russia will go beyond the uh, Ukraine. Right. So, um, no, I see no signs of the Russians trying to expand um, their influence or uh, their territory into the rest of Europe. First of all, they'll face NATO. Second of all, they've got enough problems in uh, uh, Ukraine. I think what they're doing is what the Russian state in all of its iterations, be it uh, Soviet or Imperial or even Muscovite, has done over centuries, which is create uh, buffer zones. And the Russians tried to do that with an agreement um, with uh, NATO uh, about a uh, buffer zone of a uh, non-NATO and non-Russian dominated uh, area to the west of uh, Russia, including Belarus and uh, Ukraine and Moldova. And that, of course, did not work out. That was the essence of the Russian uh, proposal from December and January of um, uh, 21 going into uh, 22. Um, uh, I think the Russians are also looking for a way out of this, um, but they are not going to sit down at the negotiating uh, table um, sort of in ignorance of the realities on the ground. And the realities on the ground right now is that they, as Peter correctly mentioned, they have annexed uh, territories beyond uh, the Donbass. Uh, they did so in September. Uh, in other words, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, last year, in other words, um, uh, it, they did it months after the beginning of the war because they didn't plan to fight such a long-term conflict. And I think they are going to now negotiate the uh, uh, total um, annexation of uh, the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, provinces. They're going to probably push for more territory of the Kherson and Zaporizhia uh, territory. And there's a lot of talk about their going towards uh, Odessa. All of this is very early to uh, really seriously discuss because things are going so slowly. But um, if this is going to be solved on the battlefields, again, so far, um, the, uh, the pendulum has swung in uh, Russia's favor simply because it has enormous resources that neither Ukraine by itself nor the Western economies, as we are now figuring out, possess because the Russians are outproducing um, all of NATO plus its allies and partners in Asia in terms of artillery shells. And I don't see how a military solution to this conflict is going to turn out in Ukraine's favor, unfortunately, which again points us all, uh, or rather the warring sides, towards a diplomatic settlement. But that is going to be a very long term and very difficult affair, but there's simply no alternative to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Peter, what's, what's the response? You know, what do people think about this? You know, uh, for example, Western countries are running out of the ammo. Uh, in terms of military support and financially, they are also meeting, uh, you know, experiencing this, this is political difficult, at least it's not as solid as in the past. Is there a concern, is there a worry that somehow, you know, this conflict has to be resolved uh, in, through negotiation and that will be probably not on terms of Ukraine? Well, contrary to what either side was saying, that, you know, the other side only understands force. Both the Ukrainians were saying that about the Russians, and the Russians are saying that about Ukrainians, uh, and then the only solution is a military one. Uh, pretty much every solution to every military conflict in history has been through negotiations one way or another. Let's be realistic about this. Once again, both speakers, uh, all of us, the entire panel, have acknowledged from coming from different uh, you know, sides uh, and different sympathies on this issue that we're not there yet, you know. And yes, there are problems. There's a huge disparity in what even a country such as North Korea, the size of North Korea has provided Russia with more uh, shells, uh, artillery shells of 155 millimeter caliber than Europe combined is able to provide Ukraine in a year. This speaks to the need for Western societies, Western countries to think long and hard about their own defense um, uh, capabilities and about what they have said and promised to Ukraine. They have to match their rhetoric with, uh, uh, with, with deeds. Or if they can't, then they have to start talking about negotiations and come up with a plan, what they are suggesting, what they're proposing. Having said that, obviously the United States, no matter what we uh, think about their ca uh, capabilities of helping Ukraine, they have a lot of weaponry. They have a lot of weaponry in the storage that they just haven't had the political will 
to uh, uh, to have a decisive uh, victory by Ukraine on the battlefield. Whether it was it would have been possible uh, then, uh, then uh, if it's not possible uh, now anymore, that's part of history. The history will decide. But there's much more uh, weapons in uh, our America's storages that we can even uh, suppose. Uh, obviously, America is now. Uh, stretched with the need to uh, also support its ally in the Middle East, Israel. But even having said that, uh, most experts will tell you, most military experts will tell you that there's still enough uh, that America uh, can do to help Ukraine. But in all Western countries, uh, there needs to be a rethinking of their military strategies. There needs to be political will shown to significantly boost their military budgets and military production. Mm -hmm. And Tang, do you think there is a political will uh, or lack of that rather in Washington or in Brussels, um, I mean, especially uh, when there's a presidential uh, election upcoming in uh, the United States? Uh, you know, there's, uh, for example, the Republican, uh, Mr. Johnson, the new speaker in the House, you know, he separated basically the bill for uh, providing uh, support to both Ukraine and Israel. Basically, he said, you know, he has the uh, the Congress approved uh, this uh, bill to support uh, Israel, um, but uh, Ukraine support is uh, left alone right now, at least for now. And obviously, there's a you know both are priorities, but seems Israel is the priority before Ukraine. Yes, um, it clearly is. And uh, most people without stating so openly have uh, communicated it. Uh, I mean, political figures here in Washington in uh, multiple uh, ways. Uh, again, uh, I believe that uh, Congress will uh, pass uh, a budget uh, that will uh, contain support for Ukraine. But look, the trend in Washington is um, uh, towards a decrease in this support. Um, the, the political will to throw everything at Ukraine the way it was done last spring and summer is simply not there any longer in the United States. And the, the direct um, and factual proof of that is that Congress is in no hurry to approve this aid um, right now. They have already sort of uh, decided to put this off until January and then they will uh, uh, continue to discuss this. In other words, they're taking a holiday while Ukraine is uh, hanging on by the skin of its teeth. So uh, no one in their right mind can argue that uh, Washington is as committed to the support of Ukraine now as it was several months ago. Um, uh, this is very bad news for the Ukrainians because this means that this war is going to be moved off the front pages and the nightly news uh, um, uh, casts, which I watch and read on a regular basis, Ukraine is simply not the top story anymore. And as the um, election approaches, I think it will be in the Biden administration's interest to sort of um, marginalize this issue because it is not a victory for Washington or NATO uh, or the West, let alone Ukraine. And bringing this up will only make uh, matters uh, worse uh, for the Biden administration, which is gonna be on the defensive against whatever Republican candidate uh, comes out on the top. That's the fate of incumbents in American elections in general and the Biden administration with age, of course, uh, uh, guaranteed to be used by the Republicans against Joe Biden personally, all of this is going to come together to create a very difficult um, mm -hmm. election season for uh, the Democrats. Yeah, very difficult uh, time ahead. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I'm Xu Qingdu. See you next time.